Hello, and welcome to Thinkers 50 at HALT, a collaboration between Thinkers 50 and HALT International Business School. I'm Des Dearlove, co-founder of Thinkers 50. And for those of you who are not familiar with Thinkers 50, our mission is to be the world's most reliable resource for identifying, ranking, and sharing the leading management and business ideas of our age, ideas that we believe can make a positive difference in the world. We published the first ever global ranking of business and management thinkers back in 2001, and we've been publishing it every two years since. In 2011, we added our Distinguished Achievement Awards, which the Financial Times calls the Oscars of management thinking. And in 2015, we introduced our annual radar list of up and coming thinkers and the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. Last year, we added our two book lists, the Thinkers 50 list of classic books and our list of current books. Over the next few weeks, we're showcasing some of the world-class business thinkers among the HALT faculty. We aim to make these sessions as interactive as possible. So please do let us know in the chat where you're joining us from today and send over your questions at any time during the session. Today, we're shining a light on sustainable business. Our guest is Matt Gitchum. Matt is Professor of Sustainability Development at HALT International Business School, where he's also director of the HALT Business for Society Research Impact Lab. He speaks and consults on sustainability, including topics such as sustainable development and sustainable business. He's also advised organizations ranging from UN Global Compact to Unilever, IBM, HSBC, and GlaxoSmithKline. In 2021, he was named to the Thinkers 50 radar list of up and coming thinkers whose ideas could make a positive difference in the world. He also contributed to this rather splendid book, a new Thinkers 50 curated book, Certain Uncertainty, Leading with Resilience in an Unpredictable World. Matt, welcome. Hi, Des. Thank you. Uh, yeah, great to be here. Great to have a chance to join yeah, the conversation. Again. Um, listen, I just mentioned certain uncertainty, you know, and the book was predicated on the on the idea that, you know, the world is increasingly, you know, VUCA, as they say, and difficult to predict. It almost sounds like that's anathema to the whole sustainability kind of movement. You know, on the one hand, you've got a very potentially unstable world. And then on the other hand, you know, we're trying to make it sort of more stable and sustainable. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's a challenge, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think certainly all of the sorts of things, many of the themes that were coming up in that book around uncertain, uh, certain uncertainty, uh, the, the different sorts of challenges business leaders are facing now, many of those things can get in the way of trying to focus on sustainability in ESG, uh, environmental, social governance issues. Those times, types of issues have been forcing their way onto the business agenda for several years, but with these all these new things coming along, hard to keep a focus on them. But I mean, I'd argue that actually, um, all of the kinds of issues and challenges associated with sustainability in ESG are themselves part of that maelstrom of things that are kind of deluging business leaders and, and they have to find a way of engaging with wh whether they want to or not. You've got um, all the different kinds of ways that ESG issues themselves are causing uncertainty and disrupting business. So you could think of the climate challenge, for example, and the increasing uh, physical challenges we're getting that from that with the increasing temperatures, the droughts, the wildfires, the flooding of an extreme weather. Uh, and that's causing disruption for business um, and different businesses in different ways. We could think of businesses in the food sector, for example, food producers like Unilever, they quote a figure of 300 million euro a year that climate change is already costing them through disruption to their supply chains. Um, so you've got that kind of disruption and uncertainty that ESG is causing. But then the other kind of disruption and uncertainty sustainability in ESG is causing is the fact that so many businesses are now trying to adapt and uh, embrace these sustainability challenges and do something about them. By doing that, they are also driving disruption in their industry sectors and forcing other businesses that aren't doing that to, to deal with the consequences. So, I mean, like uh, we can see the transitions we're seeing in the power generation sector or the automotive sector, the transition to electric vehicles. Those kinds of sector disruptions, sector changes are driving disruption for businesses. Business leaders have to engage with this stuff, whether whether they want to or not. I, mean, I know a lot of your research has actually looked at the sort of the CEO role, the changing CEO role, and, and somehow these pressures um, come to bear. But 
what I'm curious to know, which I've never asked you before, is how did you personally get interested in this subject? I mean, what, what got you involved with the sort of whole sustainability field? Uh, I mean, uh, yes. Yeah, so to be fair, it's something that I've always been interested in. And it's, it's something I, all of my working life has been around. I've studied those topics. It, in a way, the question's more, um, how did I come to get interested in the role of business in them? And um, I've been on the faculty with with Holt uh, for almost 20 years as a sustainability specialist on the faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and, and 20 years ago was when these issues were first coming on the business agenda. My, uh, to be honest, the particular starting point for me was in Colombia, mm -hmm. in Latin America, and I was doing work around human rights and civil wars and uh, got interested. I started studying and being involved in the situation that BP found itself in, effectively in the middle of a civil war. They had different factions in that conflict uh, around their refinery and their, their exploration um, uh, facilities. They found themselves in the middle of a situation and uh, where they were accused of human rights abuses, complicity in, in deaths of protesters. Um, and how did a business like that engage with that situation, try and find its way out of it? And this was the same sort of time as Shell was dealing with human rights issues in mm -hmm. Nigeria yeah, yeah. and uh, and BP and Shell, a lot of the businesses in dealing with those issues at that time were kind of trailblazers for developing the standards and the ways that businesses around the world are now engaging with human rights issues. Um, it, it was those that kind of set of things that got me engaged in the role of business in these kinds of topics and and then particularly uh, joining a business school and, and working on these topics, particularly the role of business leaders, the role of leadership, how you lead change in organizations, how you lead cultural change in organizations, how you lead change across industry sectors um, seem to be really important questions that needed needed some attention and, and some looking at. So, yeah, that was how, how I find myself in the middle of all this. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, you say that was 20 years ago. I mean, things have, yeah. thank goodness, they have, I think they've, they've moved. Sometimes it doesn't move, they feel like they've moved on as fast as some of us would like, but they have moved on. Where are we, where would you, I mean, the language you were using earlier, you know, they have to, CEOs have to engage with this stuff now. 20 years ago, people tended to try to, you know, the, the, the language was we, we don't get involved in politics. That's no longer a tenable pos position. But where would how would you summarize where we are in 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 the debate? And I appreciate probably different organisations at different points. But yeah, yeah. Well, no, exactly. I mean, it is as, as you say. Yeah, twenty years. So I've I've watched this agenda unfold and and seen the kinds of changes that have occurred. And and I've been in the the middle of that personally in a kind of business school setting and can can speak to the way that business school students engaged or didn't engage with these topics 20 years ago and how far that's changed and the kind of thirst uh, and energy for business school students to be talking about these things now. Um, I think, you know, for, for a long time, the conversation was about trying to persuade business businesses and business leaders they should be taking these topics seriously then like you say there's a kind of a spectrum that un, unfolds and some business some businesses that start taking these issues seriously start getting very seriously involved and then they so you get in some industry sectors leaders and others that are kind of lagging behind and um, something that I think it seems clear to me recently is that for a long time all these conversations around sustainability, environmental issues, climate, human rights, the, the whole spectrum of ESG issues. That conversation for a long time was about big fundamental things that we needed to be doing completely differently. And this was a massive task. And it was such a massive task that that almost shut down the conversation initially. It's just too hard. We can't do it. In the last three, four, five years, I think we've moved into a different place, which is actually now we really are in the middle of some really important real transitions like i was saying about power generation uh, automotive real transformative change is happening in some sectors in some sectors that's more advanced than it is in other sectors but you can see that that uh, real change happening we're in the middle of it and now the question has become not how do we fundamentally change something that hasn't happened yet but how do we accelerate and speed up the transitions we're already in the middle of because it's fantastic they're happening and lots of people are taking this very seriously and there's lots of lots of things at stake for people and organizations but although it's all happening it's still not happening fast enough we need to speed up so how do we do that 
I, but it's I, really I, positive. I, hope, yeah. I, was gonna, I, I said, I hope you've got the answer. But I know you've studied um, the kind of the CEO role. So, I mean, are there, uh, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but are there characteristics that you see with certain leaders? I mean, who's who's good at this? Which are the companies that, that you you admire, you look to as um, potential, you know, um, case yeah. examples? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, um, it's interesting because different companies come to the fore, I think, and play leadership roles at different times. And it's for, for a period, some organizations could be doing really amazing stuff, but then things fall back a bit and others take the lead. And you can get some organizations that play really strong leadership roles on some issues while not playing a particularly strong leadership role on other issues. Um, so you've got all of that going on and you've got particular individuals as well. I mean, I'd certainly name some of the organizations that you mentioned at the beginning that I've had the opportunity to work with a bit and, um, and, and study and do some research with. So Unilever gets cited a lot. It's held up a lot. Um, other people get a bit frustrated and, and annoyed at how often Unilever's talked about, but genuinely they've done some fantastic things and have been a model for others to look at about how you think about integrating objectives around ESG and sustainability into your strategy, creating plans that start to permeate throughout the business, how you can play a leadership role within the business, but in within the systems around the business as well. But certainly not just Unilever. I mean, there's there's lots of interesting things going on in FMCG, Nestle, Mars, for example, doing interesting things. You can look at other industry sectors too. Mention GSK and some of the interesting things going on in the pharma sector, for example. So so lots lots of interesting companies to look at, lots of different interesting individuals to look at in some of those companies. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, I, I can speak to it. We we've done a lot of we've we've done a lot of research looking at how people are experiencing the leadership role changing. So what the day job of a senior executive looks like, both at kind of CEO level, but also the next level down of, of senior leaders heading up business units within within an organization. How are people, exp you know, we've been asking the question, how have you found yourself needing to lead and how is that similar or different to the generation of business leaders that went before you? What's different now? What are you, what are you spending your time doing and how's that different and what, skills does that mean are important um a theme that i've consistently heard from um from from people stepping into those most senior roles in organizations is suddenly they found themselves in the middle of having to deal with all kinds of different esg issues and things they had to get involved in in the, in the kind of public sphere and speak about or or try and lead within their organization and them saying it, it it was completely different to anything they'd experienced previously in their career and all the things that they needed to be good at to advance in their career to get them to this stage none of that had pre prepared them for what they suddenly had to step into and they had to learn they had to learn in the role in the moment very fast steep learning curve and all of that sort of thing and yeah nothing in their previous career had prepared them for that nothing in their business education or things they'd done at business school had prepared them or you know leadership development and so that's part of why we're, we're interested to do this research say well what is it what are, what are those things you're suddenly finding yourself having to do and what are the implications of that for people who provide leadership development corporate human resources departments business schools so um so that's some of the work we've been doing i can i can speak to some of the specifics um I yeah, I mean, what, you, you immediately what that brought to mind was um, one of one of my favourite business book titles of all time, the Marshall Goldstein book. What got you here won't get you there, and and that's you know that's spot on, and often is um, the case. Um, you mentioned um, Unilever, Paul Polman and Andrew Winston, of course, are in our ranking. They wrote um, Net Positive, which I do recommend to any any business. Yeah, yeah, it's it's book. here yeah, somewhere on the and, shelf. Yes, yeah. as well. No, very very um very good. Um, making the connection from Marshall Goldsmith and a sort of segue to another executive coach. We have a question from Dean Miles, um, which I'm going to, I'm going to try to, you know, I we want to make this interactive. So people please do yeah, send in your question. So Dean says, I'm seeing organizations blending the ideas of business continuity and sustainability. Organizations can enhance their ability to withstand disruptions and reduce risks while promoting the planet well-being and society. How do you, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but I, I think I think there's something there. I think, as you said, yeah. it, the, the point being that these these some of these themes are coming together now in a way that hopefully is 
is helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a great observation, and I'd completely agree. Um, and I guess what that that brings to mind for me is um, uh, there's there's it's important to be paying attention to what's going on in the world and thinking about implications for the business. So one way you can talk about that is managing risk. Um, but there's there's an aspect of that whole that whole agenda which is just about um, uh, being a well-run business and paying attention not trying to you know get away with just the minimum that you've got to do not paying attention to things um uh, flying by the seat of your pants sort of thing but actually putting in place the systems that make sure you're managing risks you're you're paying attention to making sure things don't go wrong so that can be things like environmental impact assessments and environmental management systems it can be to do with human rights due diligence and knowing your supply chain investigating your supply chain looking at areas that are high risk and taking steps to manage them and being proactive about all that kind of management that's all about business continuity and making sure Sure that you are not uh, floored by some challenge that comes along because you weren't putting any uh, energy into managing it. Having said that, of course, you know the thing with with external shocks where we sort of started. You know, obviously we, we've had we had COVID, we had we've got Ukraine, we've got we've got disruption in terms of you know the energy markets, we've got cost of living um, problem you know issues, we've got inflation. It, it's that it's that thing between the the, the short term. And the long term, and I mean, in the end, arguably, um, you know, Paul Polman, who was all about managing for the long run at Unilever and not dancing to the, the tune that Wall Street played and, you know, taking a longer view. Obviously, eventually he got eased out of Unilever. But how I mean, how can how can you kind of navigate in a straight line with the sustainability issues when 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 you've got these nasty waves coming over the whole time? And and I mean, and keep the job. I mean, it's, it's a, as you say, yeah. it's a. It's something of a you know a nightmare in some ways. Yeah, uh, it, it is, and I guess um, you know there are no e easy answers to that challenge. Um, I guess my observation would be, yes, you we we have these waves of disruption, and they get in the way of taking a long term view and trying to to manage for the long term, but those waves of disruption are only going to be worse if if you're not trying to put in place the steps that do protect you and have give you a well managed business for the long term and and these things are themselves part of the waves of disruption so it's hard there's no easy way of doing it but i think the the looking at the lessons of the businesses from the last 20 years since these things have been on the agenda the more energy you put into trying to manage these things effectively over the long term the better insulated you are but that doesn't mean you are totally insulated you still got waves of things that are going to come your way and i mean yeah you, i mean you talked about Pullman and being eased out and you could look at look, the experience of leaders in companies like Danone as well i mean it's it's risky it's risky trying to put yourself out there to be a leader on these sorts of issues. It, you know, there, there are going to be constituencies that are unhappy about that and think that it's not caught your job. I mean, like I was saying, the research we've been we've been doing here about the changing role of business leaders, I think, comes to argue that it is now core to the job. But there's certainly constituencies out there who don't think it's core to the job, think it's a distraction, that you're being distracted from the core business. Um, you'll be criticized for that potentially challenged and, and pushed out. Um, but as much as there's going to be challenge about business leaders who do put themselves out in front on these issues, there are equally risks for business leaders who don't. Um, you know, silence on these issues is as much as a risk for your business as speaking out on them. Speaking out is difficult and risky, but but silence is risky too. There'll be people who'd be unhappy your, with your business for doing that. Uh, and if you if you don't put thought and energy into these things you open yourselves up to the kind of risks we've just been talking about so it, 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 it's not it, there's no easy there's no easy way <laughs> no, no no i see that um i mean as you say too i mean if you stay silent for too long i mean there are some organizations probably desperately trying to play catch up now but yeah. and, and you can't what if you haven't if you haven't owned it and, and begun to integrate it into your strategy and to speak the language and to be a um lead in the in that direction it's very hard to make up ground later because it, it it just looks bad i think um we have another couple of questions coming in um okay question from erica what role does hr have to play in developing sustainable leaders but also in driving the sustainability agenda within the business where should responsibility sit 
Yeah, um, no, great questions. And well, like I hinted at before, um, you know, we've been doing research about what it is that's changing about the role of a business leader. And, and maybe I should say a, a, a couple of words about the specifics of that. But then that has implications for the people tasked with hiring, recruiting, selecting the next genera generation of business leaders and developing them. And uh, and it also has implications for the kind of performance management systems and how people are rewarded re and remunerated. And all of that sits with, with HR. I mean, I think, so maybe I should say, uh, a couple of words about these this changing leadership role because then there's some specifics about implications for hr um so the sorts of things uh, and i've hinted at hinted at it a bit already we kind of heard three things when we heard when we talked to business leaders about their experience of how the role was changing and and the first was around how um they were thinking differently about what the role was, the scope of the role, the nature of the role. And then that different conception of what the role was had some implications for leadership activities inside the organization and then also outside the organization. And the core thing about how the thinking about the role had changed was um, was that this, is, this stuff is now part of the day job. A, a generation ago, stuff to do with society was someone else's job i mean you know a generation ago like i was talking about um with my story about bp in colombia uh, 20 25 years ago um those people were operating in colombia thinking the civil war human rights all of that it's someone else's business there's the there's the government there's there's ngos there's the army in that particular case we're just an oil company taking oil out of the ground getting it to the coast taking it around the world for people meeting people's energy needs all of that stuff is someone else's job um but for a variety of reasons you business leaders have come to realize it's part of their job now as much as government leaders, NGOs, people in society. You think you can look at the challenges around climate, the complexity. Yes, it's about leadership from governments, but we know all the things that make it difficult for governments to play the leadership role that they ought to. Um, businesses, the, you know, the kind of scale of power and influence they have on the world stage these days, that forces them into a leadership, needing to play a leadership role, whether they want to or not. Others have that expectation, expectation of them companies have to play that leadership role there is all the pressures on them to do that so that forces a business leader to do it paul polman you mentioned um mm -hmm. i remember one of the conversations i had with him i asked him about proportion of his working week and he said something like and it, I, I, I can't quote this directly so i feel a little bit bad doing that here in a public setting but um he did say something like well my work you have to understand my working week is seven days a week 15 hours a day but in that context i'm probably putting two to three days a week into sustainability and esg that's the proportion of my day job that this stuff is um and and so i think that's that's real the day job has changed the it, it this stuff is part of it and it's not it's part of the day job but it's also not aside from how you make money it's not like you, there's things you do to make money and then there's things you do to manage sustainability which at the end of the day are a cost and a, a distraction it is part of how you protect and create value for your firm so those two things are, are really how the thinking about the leadership role has changed and then as i say that gets you into different kinds of activities and things people are spending their time doing and one side of that is around the leadership role inside the organization and there's a lot to do, funnily enough, with talk, uh, talking and the, the narratives you construct as a leader and the, the how you talk about the purpose of the organization and how the, the purpose of the work everyone is involved in, how that connects with the kinds of goals that get set and the targets that get monitored and what as a leader you're holding other people accountable for and rewarding them for. Uh, so there's a whole set of things like that that uh, there's. There's things around the stories you tell and how you champion or celebrate certain things, how you how you seem to spend your own time, what you prioritize. All of that way, all those sorts of ways you act and talk create space for other people to do things and feel safe to do them. So if you're always talking down sustainability and SG and saying, this is a waste of time, yeah. people won't feel safe to put any time into it. Yeah. But if you... I've seen to put your time into it and make space for it that will make other people feel confident to do the same and that those kind of intangible things that are around cultural influence in organizations that that is um 
alongside all the technical stuff to do with carbon reporting and offsetting and strategies and th that cultural leadership side is really important and then the other thing the third thing we heard a lot about was business leaders obviously have always thought of themselves as having a leadership role in the organization that's kind of wrapped up in the definition but they haven't tended in the past to consider that they have a leadership role outside the organization as a business leader you tend to respond to an external context and lead your organization in response to an external context but um coming to realize that actually there's a really important leadership role outside which can mean um trying to lead change in your supply chain persuading your suppliers to do things differently maybe trying to persuade your customers or your end consumers to do things differently um maybe working in partnership with your competitors trying to persuade your competitors to do things differently so you you all move together at, at the same time in an industry ecosystem maybe actually the regulatory framework isn't really the regulatory framework that you need and actually it's your leadership role to go to the regulator um one particular example comes to mind uh, um, coca-cola enterprises which it's got a different name now but it was the bottling part of coca-cola in, in western europe um, and I remember the chief executive there a number of years telling me the progression in his thinking about his leadership role and how initially there was all this pressure and complaint around. It was a particular story about packaging and recycling and people complaining that um, Coke's about Coke bottles and litter. And uh, he, he was saying, well, first of all, we kind of said it's it's not our job. Our job is to sell Coke. But then they said, okay, you know, we, we realize we've got a leadership role in trying to deal with this. So we'll make our bottles recyclable. Um, but then they got the feedback. Great. You've got recyclable bottles, but nobody's recycling them. So, and they said, well, that's not our problem. That's, that's our consumer's problem. If they don't want to recycle their problem, but then they say, oh no, actually fair enough. We have a leadership role in trying to influence our consumers to behave differently so that they want to recycle. And they took on that that layer of leadership in their ecosystem around them, and they had some success. And they were all, over time, people wanted to recycle the bottles. But then the problem was that there wasn't the recycling infrastructure for people to be able to recycle those bottles once they wanted to. And again, they Coke say, "Well, okay, great, we've done our bit. That's that's to do with government and local authorities, and it's their responsibility, their role to create the infrastructure to be able to recycle bottles." And um, uh, but also, but the pressure kept coming and eventually said, well, okay, no, fair enough. We're, we're a powerful, influential organization. Um, we take on the leadership role to get to go to the policymakers and government and local authorities and say, we need this recycling infrastructure to exist. We're, we're going to work with you and we're going to try and bring all the power and persuasion and influence to bear that we can to say, how do we make this re recycling infrastructure exist? So do you see what I mean? It's kind of different levels of leadership in the system around the organization uh, yeah so anyway I'm, that's the kind of story of an the... going out or ripples going out into into society yeah just a couple of things on that i mean you you well, on the cultural point you, you were referencing people feeling safe to mm. um have ideas and to and to and to engage with this stuff obviously that touches on psychological safety amy edmondson's work um who is is number one in, i mean we that that idea, the idea of psychological safety, um, yeah. as, as Amy has said, you know, I, she's an overnight success, it, uh, meteoric rise, but it's taken her twenty years of research to get there. Um, but it's it's amazing how that that um, language has now entered not just the business uh, lexicon. I mean, you know, people in the pub talk about it. Um, I was talking to a former <laughs> astronaut. And he no was, he was yeah. saying, you know, that's what went wrong at NASA. There was no psychological safety. So, but this language is very, very powerful. Yeah. yeah. Now, the language of sustainability yeah. is sustainability still the right language? Are there, when I talk to Andrew Winston, he's sort of like, well, I'm not sure how helpful that is anymore because it should be integrated into everything. And by by calling it, you know, do we want a chief sustainability officer or do we actually want everybody in the organisation, you know, involved yeah. in sustainability? What's your yeah, take yeah, on yeah, that? yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, I mean, first of all, just really interested in what the connection you were making with psychological safety and, and Amy's work. And I'd make another connection with with a colleague of mine who, who you know very well, Megan Wrights, and the work around Absolutely. speaking up and how you create a culture where people yeah. feel safe to speak up and and 
a culture that accepts employee activism and that sort of thing. So that's another point of connection with with all of this. Um, but yeah, what's the right language? I mean, it's tricky. Um, none of the language is ideal. Uh, a lot of it's quite unhelpful. And at the same time, it, I'd say it's a struggle to find the right language. So um, sustainability has been the, the, the kind of catch-all word for quite a long time. Um, but it comes with a lot of baggage. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, one of the issues with it is people associate it particularly with environmental issues, but but really it's a, uh, it, it's, it was originally aiming at a spectrum of environmental and social issues. Um, and there's other kinds of problems with it. And, and like you say, one of the issues is that it can create a sense of separation in that there's, there's what we do. And then there's this sustainability thing over yeah, there, which exactly. is something different. Yeah. Um, you've also, you know, in more recent times had the language of ESG come along, um, which has been, uh, I think particularly coming from the investor community, it's, it's a way of conceptualizing these things in that community. But then when it's investors who are bringing pressure to bear, it's that kind of language that gets uh, picked up by businesses. Um, and there, in some ways, that is a bit more helpful than sustainability, but it it also has a, its own baggage. And um, we've you know we've talked before, and, and others have talked about the the backlash in certain places around ESG coming for a variety of different angles. There's you know there's the kind of there's particular sections of the political spectrum uh, on the right that are very anti the ESG agenda. But also there's there's challenges from sustainability advocates as well, because really ESG at its core is about how you manage an organization, how you manage environmental and social governance issues to protect shareholder value, mm. which is a good thing when share, when that aligns with achieving sustainability goals. But but actually, some of the things we need to do, some of the transitions we need to make around net zero, uh, it, for some businesses at some points in time, might not be good for shareholder value. So it's anyway. So there's problems with a lot of this language, um, and yet frequently you need to put a name to the thing you're talking about. I, I, I mean, and I also want to pick up on what you said about the chief sustainability officer, and it, again, it comes back to this conversation about leadership and. I mentioned my experience of the stories I'd heard from a lot of business leaders about the moment they got to a particularly senior level and they suddenly stepped into a whole load of stuff that they weren't prepared yeah. for stuff. And again, wanting a word for it, which is mainly it could be sustainability or ESG. But the other thing that I've heard frequently is that many organizations have great sustainability, chief sustainability officers, or, or maybe that job has got a different, title um, and the and great teams uh, and the, those individuals and teams work very well with the chief executive and the most senior business leaders and more and more businesses are starting to take a, a global sustainability team and then replicate it in different regions so there's a whole infrastructure someone said to me the other day this is a function that has made it to the org chart um, uh, and which is great and it's a sign of the the success of this set of ideas and the way that it's get, getting embedded but it has exactly that risk that um it creates that psychological idea that it's a thing over there rather than something for me so the thing that i hear frequently from and about senior leaders who are that next level down is that they they see their organization engaging with sustainability in ESG. They see the kind of strategies and goals and targets being developed in the corporate center. They see the work of the chief sustainability officer and they hear the language of the chief executive talking about these things, but they don't, they haven't yet, many of them really come to see the meaning of it for them in their roles as a senior leader in somewhere in the business, as a business unit head or something else. For those people, what I hear is it's still something else over there. They're glad that it's happening, but they don't precisely see on a day to day basis the implications for them in their role and the leadership role that they could be playing. And again, that's something we've been trying to do some research around around. Well, how does it show up? How can it show up for people in your sort of role? There's probably all sorts of ways that they are playing a leadership role already on these topics, but they've not thought of it in those terms. And there's probably lots of important things like some of those themes I was talking about before about language and the way they are seen by others to play their role that creates space for others. That's all really important. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's the language is a challenge, but um, yeah, we've got to we've got to find some words. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and the I'm, I'm going to come back to some of the questions because we've got lots of questions coming and we've got people joining us from great, all over the place. Great. Um, so um, no, I was having a conversation recently, you know, on the back of the of the of the of the book, where I was saying actually, if a leader now stands up and tells me and, and says publicly that they've got all the answers. I would be suspicious because the world is changing too far. By the way, they never did have all the answers, but they we we bought into that a little bit. We wanted leaders who were reassuring and told us that they they you know they they knew what they were doing the whole time. Personally, and I think a lot of people now are looking for leadership, people who are prepared to say, I don't necessarily know what's around the next corner, but I'm do my darndest to make it make it right and to work with everybody and to be inclusive to address those issues. Similarly, I'm at the point now where any business leader who isn't talking about, you know, the long-term prospects of the planet and doing something about climate change, I, I would be concerned about. So there is a kind of a, a logic to why even people who are business heads should be beginning to um, recognize that they have a, an external role. I mean, the bigger risk really is to not do anything isn't it i think we i think we've hopefully we've begun to turn at least begun to turn that corner i think a lot of younger people have you know were there already ahead of ahead of some of the rest of us but is this a generational thing i've got i mean elizabeth here is saying to me it seems like we're advancing the wrong leaders or appointing leaders based on the wrong skills are we getting better at this is there a new generation with a with a bit more dynamism and a bit more prepared to be a bit more gutsy about this stuff are you seeing that coming through um and and can we do more to encourage it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, uh, great question. Great observation. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, yes. Um, I guess I'll try and give a sort of bit of a, a, a nuanced answer. Um, so, I think norms are shifting. Okay. I, I say that as someone living in the UK, Western Europe norms are changing in some places uh, not necessarily all places there's lots of i mean i work with organizations and do leadership development have these sorts of conversations with business leaders everywhere all over the world and you know it's fascinating particularly now when you can do executive education online and you've you've got people from every corner in the world on as part of the conversation and you you get the i mean you actually you, that was happening before lockdown anyway but you know, you you're having people sharing shifting cultural norms in different countries and how that's you get one thing in western europe a different thing in north america something else in latin america or, or yeah. south asia or what have you but uh, with that caveat aside norms are shifting um compared with 20 years ago uh definitely the younger generation are much more familiar with these topics take it much more for granted that they're important and something should be being done about them um i i would say uh, I also increasingly see the same thing amongst senior business leaders. And I, th I think something that's quite interesting compared with 10 or 15 years ago is, like we were saying before, 10 or 15 years ago, business leaders thought there was not, this was nothing to do with them, wasn't mm -hmm. their job. They also weren't very familiar with the detail. In many organizations now, senior business leaders, they can be amongst the better educated people in society about the detail of these things and can be more informed advocates than many other people. And that's something that's changed because of work that's been done to educate business leaders. So yes, we've got, it, it's much more of a norm in the younger generation, but we do see much better educated and motivated senior leaders. But in both cases, although there's the motivation and the energy and the thinking this is important, the skill then to actually do something with that and to be an effective leader on these topics is is the next challenge and where there's there's less um less that's been done more that needs to be done so you could think about today's senior business leaders and i'm thinking about some of the conversations that i frequently have yes there's widespread awareness now that it's really important and something their organization should be doing but not necessarily much like i was just saying much awareness about what their role is and the skill they would need to do it. So there is something really important about taking things they've come to feel and think important and finding the language and practice using the language to talk mm -hmm. to others about that in a way that's going to enable others. Um, part of the language of the comment was, are we appointing the wrong people? Mm -hmm. So there I'd make a link back to the question a few minutes ago about implications for human resources. And there's something systematic 
that's important to look at, which is what are the things that get taken into account and valued when making decisions about who to appoint to senior roles? And skills, uh, awareness, mindset, skills, attitudes around this agenda is something that should be on the checklist, literally written into the bullet point list of things we want to pay attention to and make a decision about. There's a, there was a UN Global Compact um, study done a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, I, got the, I did make a note of the numbers in case it came up. Um, uh, they, they did, it was done, UN Global Compact, done with Russell Reynolds Associates, so uh, executive search. Um, and they they looked at, they surveyed business leaders, 92% of business leaders thought all of this was really important, pretty obvious. They looked at then C-suite role descriptions and the kind of language that was getting in, written in there. And they found that only 4% of those job descriptions or role descriptions made any reference to competence around ESG and sustainability. So there's a very specific, are we appointing the wrong people? Um, we're certainly not looking for the right things we when making appointment decisions. Right things, yeah. Um, and then, but yeah, you know, I think we can have a lot of confidence in, in the next generation. And with the business education work I do with younger students, um, the energy, the interest, the vibe has completely changed. But I don't think it's enough, therefore, to take it for granted that the problem solved. You can take, you need to take that energy and just as with the senior leaders, work on. So, what's the specific knowledge that you need to know? And that's about the issues, but it's also about how to integrate that into different business disciplines. Uh, and what are the skills that you're going to need to be an effective advocate and change agent on these things in the business? Um, the next generation need that work uh, just as much as the current generation. Okay, I've got a question I, I want to make time for. I want to I want to put to you because in some ways you were talking about different attitudes in different parts of the world, and yeah, um, yeah. I haven't got a name for this for this person because they're they're joining us by from LinkedIn. But in my country, South Africa, where unemployment the unemployment rate is alarmingly high, what should we do? Should we should our effort to prioritize sustainability initiatives be triumphant over our efforts to eradicate unemployment? Being less concerned about sustainability implications thereof, and this is a this is a real issue for you know um, parts of the world, uh, particularly you know developing economies and, and par parts of the world. You, you know you were contrasting attitudes in North America and Europe, but it, the trade off is is still a big issue for a lot of people. I mean, like, yeah, does it have to yeah. be a trade off? I mean, should it be a trade off? Well, actually, yeah, 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 exactly. You no, know, a really important question, um, and. You know, on one level, I'm going to give an easy answer, even though I know it's not an easy. There are no easy answers. The ideal is about creating the employment opportunities in the industries of the future. So, yes, tackling unemployment is really important. It's really important everywhere. There's some places where it's like South Africa, where it's amongst the highest priorities. But how do you be choiceful about where you want to create those jobs and and you know the the the, the low carbon economy the, the net zero industries as far as it's possible to do look to create the opportunities there rather than industries that are part of the problem and that we need to move away from that's easy for me to say like that i know it's nothing like as easy as that in practice but that's that would be my starting point no that makes sense um we have one minute left so um i'm just scanning looking for some questions um let me let me ask you this. I mean, AI, generative AI. Um, obviously, we're getting it's got a mixed press at the moment, to say the least. Is the is do you see technology as being what I'm going to ask? This is a two part question, and you've got you've got just a minute <laughs> just to make life easy. Right. Is technology part of it? Can it help? Is it is it potentially part of the solution? And the other question is: Are you optimistic both on you know about the technology, but also about about the future of sustainability and saving the planet, if you like? Um, so, well, on the first one, yes. I mean, there's lots of opportunities. There's, there's and it's well documented. There's lots of ethical issues and concerns and challenges yeah. around AI that we need to move fast to start thinking about how to manage and, and govern well. Putting that aside, there's lots of opportunities, and particularly, um, you know, one aspect of the ESG agenda is how you manage supply chains well, both on environmental and human rights issues. And there's lots of ways that technology can is looking, giving some very promising things on that. Um, am I optimistic? Um, 
Uh, it's actually a conversation that I find myself in frequently with lots of other people working in this sort of field. Uh, my answer is I think you have to be if you're going to work in this field. That There is a psychological, the stuff that we are talking about here is genuinely terrifying. Uh, and you, anytime you actually pause and look at the latest issue, situation with a lot of these things and, and really confronted that, it is really terrifying and that it could tend, send you into doom spiral very quickly, which is why most people literally put it, their heads in the sand without noticing. Um, but there's so many reasons, like I was saying before, so many reasons to be hopeful and optimistic. Look at the kinds of transitions that are now happening. We can build on that and, and go forward. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll stop there. I, I, I will say you, you, you mentioned um, right at the beginning the the lab. I'll take a moment as we're, we're coming to an end just to say the sorts of things I've been talking about. We've got several research projects looking into different aspects of this going on within the research lab on, on sustainability and society at HALT. Um, we're also getting off the ground lots of new research projects and anyone who's been listening to this conversation taking part interested in any of this I'd love to we're on the lookout for collaborators people interested in partnering with us on this research so other academics and other academic institutions organizations that are working on these themes so anyone who might be uh, uh, taking part in this conversation uh, and interested but love to talk to you. Fantastic. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time. I knew this would happen. This conversation, we could talk about this for hours. A huge thanks to Matt and to all of you for tuning in. Our guest next week will be Amanda Neiman Peters. Amanda is Professor of Leadership at HALT an author of Working with Influence, Nine Principles of Persuasion to Accelerate Your Career. So please join us. Same place, same time. Join us then.